That's okay. Bozen? Here. Voss? Here. Colvin? Here. Westergaard? Here. Mandelbaum? Here. Gatto? Here. We have a quorum. Item two is approving the agenda as presented and or as amended. Move. Is there a second? There's a move. It's been moved and seconded. Uh, please vote. <laughs> we have them all. Six, yes. Six. Movement pa passes. The item uh, three is the approval of renewal request for a two year extension of the designated housing allocation plan to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Board communication number 23-538. Second. There's a motion on the table. Please vote. Six, yes. Motion carries. Item four, approving a 2080 agreement between the city of West Des Moines, Polk County, Des Moines Municipal Housing Agency, and the city of Des Moines for the analysis of impediments of, to fair housing. Is there a motion to approve or any discussion? Move approval. There's a please vote. Six yes. Motion passes. Item five is approving the submittal of the Resident Opportunity Self Sufficiency Service Coordinator Program grant application to the U.S. Department of Housing and Urban Development. Board communication number 23 537. Is there any discussion? If not, is there a motion? See none. Move item five. Item has been moved. Is there a second? Second. Please vote. Get in, get in the game, huh? Six, yes. <laughs> motion carries. At this time, I will... Move item six to adjourn. To adjourn. Is there a second to adjourn? Please vote. Or do we go voice? Oh, yeah, you do voice vote. Those, those in favor? Aye. Motion carries. We are now adjourned. Use that gavel, girl. Thank you. Um, it's a, it's a, it's been a wonderful place and lots of different things to do. So thank you all very much. Congratulations. Thank you. So, so thank you. Just a few years here. Just so <laughs> with that, we will reconvene at uh, five o'clock for our regular meeting.
I'd like to call a December 4th, uh, 2023 meeting to order. Please take the roll. County. Here. Bozen. Here. Voss. Here. Coleman. Here. Westergaard. Here. Mandelbaum. Here. Gatto. Here. We have a quorum. Next item is approving the agenda as presented and or as amended. The following items 28B at, has been added. It's the final consideration of ordinance above. Waiver requested by Ryan Francois. Manager Rally Cap Properties LLC requires six votes. 34 is updated and 35 is updated. Move approval. Is there a second? Second. Please vote. Aye. Seven yes. Motion carries. Next item is approving the consent agenda. Those are items three through 26. These are routine, routine items and will be enacted by one roll call vote without separate discussions unless pursuant to council rules, council requests an item to remove to be considered separately. And tonight we have uh, number five, county votes no, 7B, Mandelbaum votes no, 7C, Coleman wishes to speak, 14, Mandelbaum wishes to speak, and 18, Mandelbaum wishes to speak. With that, is Move there a Move approval. Is there a second? Uh, second. Please vote. You can't second. Aye. Okay. Oh, I thought I had I guess I have to. Seven, vote. yes. <laughs> Motion carries. As a reminder for those items where public comment is not taken or to convey information generally to the council or the city manager, Des Moines re residents are encouraged to submit letters or emails, texts or phone calls with additional comments or information to ensure they are sharing information they would like shared. For the next items, which are our hearing items, for the seven hearings this evening, we have one zoning hearing, number 31, four vacation hearings, one urban renewal amendment, and one public improvement authorization hearing. As a reminder for the zoning items only, which is item number 31, we will hear from the parties in interest first and then the general public. The parties in interest for the zoning items include only the applicant for the rezoning and those persons living within 200 feet of the property to be rezoned, to whom the city has sent notices. After all the parties in interest, have commented, we will open it up to any member of the public for germane comments. To aid in recognizing the parties and interests who may speak on the zoning items, I will ask everyone else not to step to the microphone unless they are the zoning applicant or live within 250 feet and receive mail notice of rezoning. After all the parties and interest have been called upon, the general public will be called upon for germane public comments at not to exceed one minute per person to a maximum of seven minutes per hearing unless the hearing is ended sooner for failure to make germane public comments. For the other hearings this evening, any interested person may make germane comments at not to exceed one minute per person to a maximum of five minutes per hearing, unless the hearing is ended sooner for failure of making germane comments or when comments cease. As a reminder on the public improvements hearings, only comments as to the plans, specifications, form of documents, and engineer's estimates and low bidder's designation will be considered germane. All other comments will be considered non-germane. With that, we'll go to the first item, number 27. On vacation of alley right-of-way extending 211 feet north from Clark Street between Martin Luther King Jr. Parkway and 19th Street for the fire station for relocation project. A is the first consideration of the ordinance above. If someone would like to come up and speak, just state your name and address. Good evening, ladies and gentlemen of the City Council. My name is Jason Zilp. I live on the 1500 block of 19th Ward 1. Speaking on agenda item 27 regarding the alley vacation for the fire station for a relocation project, I express strong opposition due to procedural concerns and potential ownership dispute. 
Firstly, the city's notification process to interested parties seems inadequate and crucial lapse in adhering to a democratic processes and ensuring informed community participation. Secondly, there is unresolved issues regarding the actual ownership of the properties in question. Moving forward without clear ownership confirms risks legal challenges, including potential misrepresentation or fraud. I urge the council to reconsider this decision, prioritizing transparency and legal soundness. Rushing this procedure undermines good governance and the trust of our community. Thank you for considering my concerns. Thank you. I, I would uh, move it. I'd like to make two quick comments. Number one, this is an alley that the city owns and it isn't the disputed ownership of the private property. Um, and for that reason, uh, the city has to do this in order to assemble the land. I would suggest, and I'll move it, and I don't know the right language yet, but there's a way to waive the second and third readings. 42A. 42A. Pursuant to A. So pursuant to rule 42A, I would uh, move the first, second, and third readings. Okay, is there a second? Second. There's a motion on the table. Please vote. Aye. Seven, yes. Motion carries. Item number 28, on vacation of the south, 100 feet of the north-south alley right-of-way located east of and adjoining 60124th Street and conveyance to Rally Cap Properties, LLC, for $100. A is the first consideration of the ordinance above, and B, the final consideration of the ordinance above. Waiver requested by Ryan Francois, manager Rally Cap Properties, LLC, requires six votes. Is there any party of interest? Or any other speakers at this point? Seeing none, Mayor Pro Tem, I will move item 28. 28A and 28B. Second. So motion, please vote. Aye. Seven, yes. Motion carries. Next item is item number 29, on vacation of a portion of East 22nd Street right of way located west of and adjoining to 2200 Elizabeth Avenue and conveyance to Larry D. Henson and Rita Henson for $100. A is first consideration of the ordinance above. Anyone wishing to speak on this? No, we'll open it up. I will move item 29A and first move to rule 22. There's second. second. Please vote. Aye. Seven, yes. Motion carries. Item 30, on vacation of air and surface rights within portions of Southwest 7th Street, right of way adjoining 106 Southwest 7th Street and conveyance of a permanent easement for airspace above city-owned property and a permanent easement for building encroachment door swing to 106 Southwest 7th Street, LLC, for $370. A is first consideration of the ordinance above. So anyone wishes to speak to this? <coughs> I'll open it up. Seeing no one, I'll move item 30, 30A, and pursuant to rule 42A, waive the second and third reading. Second. Please vote. Aye. Seven, yes. Motion carries. 31, on a request from Professor Holdings, LLC, to a son officer to amend the plan DSM, creating our tomorrow comprehensive plan to revise the future land use classification from low density residential within a neighborhood node to medium density residential within a neighborhood node and to rezone 1315 York Street from N3C residential district to N3C-4 residential district to allow expansion of the existing off street parking area. A is a first consideration of ordinance above. B, final consideration of ordinance above. Waiver requested by the applicant, and it requires six votes. 
So the first is the parties and interest and the applicant and those within 200 feet of the property will be given five minutes to speak. Is there anyone here tonight? Is there anyone from the public that would like to speak? Good evening, Council. I'm Sheila Canopla Odole. I live at 2518 Kenway Drive. And um, I just wanted to um, question why we should expand off street parking um, in terms of, in light of like climate change. Is this something that we really need to do? Is there a more creative way we can increase parking? I'm just asking the question. So I just wanted to say that. Thank you. Anyone else wishing to speak? If not, we'll open it up for discussion. That's. In, the neighborhood was supportive of it. The neighbors around it were supportive of it. It gets the street, the cars off the street. Now, staff wants to come in and talk about it, but. If council have questions for staff. No. I will um, move item 31, 31A and B. Second. Please vote. Aye. Six, seven, yes. Motion carries. Item 32 on the proposed third amendment to the urban renewal plan for the Oak Park, Highland Park urban renewal area, council communication number 23-543A is the first consideration of the ordinance above, repealing ordinance 16,000, which established Oak Park, Highland Park, TIF district number three, Final consideration of ordinance above waiver requested by Cody Christensen, Development Services Director, requires six votes. Is there any discussion on that? Seeing no one. Seeing none, I will move item 32A and B. Second. Please vote. Aye. Seven, yes. Motion carries. Next item is 33 on 2nd Avenue reconstruction from University to the Des Moines River. Resolution approving plans, specifications, form of contract, documents, engineer's estimate, receive and file bids, and designating the lowest responsible, responsible bidder as Synergy Contracting LLC. Jesse Rognes, President, for $17,148,218.80. Council Communications number 23-5527, approval of contract, A is approval of contract and bond. I'll open it up, anyone would like to comment on this? If not, I'll open it up to the council. Well, first, thank you. <clears throat> thank you for the warm welcome. There's not anything going on in Ward 1 the first <laughs> 10 days of my tenure. Um, this is a, a a project in many ways that's long overdue. There's a lot of things that I'm uncomfortable about it and had a chance to, to meet with uh, people on 2nd Avenue a little bit ago. Um, my intention originally, and I want to make these comments anyway, is that many of the neighbors down there and the businesses along that corridor kind of feel like when they agreed to shrink the number of lanes to three, it was with the assumption that the utility lines would be able to be buried and that that would enable the budget to be there. I know there's a lot of complications about that and and most of the ones that I think remain are with the businesses themselves that have to spend some money to you know accommodate um, where the service would come into the building. I, I, I would still like the city to try and make an effort uh, to address that and have a long-term plan. I just don't think um, strong modern cities are, are perpetuating that, that kind of overhead utilities. And in this area, there's spots where there's, you know, nine, ten wires on a, on a pole. 
And it is, it is, you know, the primary distinction of Second Avenue right now, and it would be great to clean it up. That was my comments before I got here. In the in the last you know half hour or so, we've been provided some information about the contractor in question, um, and I'm not exactly sure legal and uh, Scott what you would recommend me say or not say, but I think factually I can say there's been some uh, information provided to us from significant violations from uh, from OSHA, um, so not third party but real government oversight. And as I have tried to read this in the last little bit, those violations are categorized and, and a couple of these are categorized as serious. I'm uncomfortable um, asking the council or making the motion or even supporting tonight's action uh, to approve this project and this contractor. And so at, at minimum, I'd like it to be delayed um, and for us to, to look in and look at those allegations. Um, I, I don't want to create any legal peril for us, so I think I'll stop talking there and ask for some advice on how to move um, or what what we should do next. And maybe the rest of the council wants to pass it and move on, but I'm I'm not prepared to do that tonight. Yeah, uh, Mayor and Council, um, I think it would be prudent uh, to to let us have some time to understand those complaints, confirm. The, the situation and understand when those took place. Uh, obviously, companies change ownership, change leadership, things of that nature. Uh, so there may be a uh, very good reason why uh, it makes sense to still continue this with this uh, award. However, I cannot tell you that that is my best recommendation for you at this moment, given how recent we just found this out. So uh, my recommendation would be to continue the hearing if legal agrees. That way it stays open and bring it right back because we can get this answer to you pretty quickly. Uh, bring it right back to the December four or December 18th uh, council meeting. So is that so, so any we'll, action that we need to take? To, or it would just just simply to continue. Okay. To, to I just, ask just a quick question to your first comment about the power lines. Will you bring us back something that has anything to do with the power lines? Because I would... I mean, if the property owners knew or thought they were going to be buried, and then now they're not, so no, I guess, I well, guess that would be my. I, I, I can. Know, I don't know. Mm -hmm. Yeah. I'm not, so I, yes, yeah. I we can bring back additional uh, history of that conversation. Uh, Councilman is correct that uh, some of the very very early conversations, uh, those types of of uh, belief and assumptions were in place. However, uh, at the conclusion of many months of those discussions with the neighborhood, I'm, I'm pretty confident they understood that they would not get buried, and we moved forward with the design in that regard. But I think it's worth uh, bringing back to you that history and to be able to show uh, what the cost was, because the cost was a huge factor in, in undergrounding those. So and then it's, can, can, I, can I just say a couple things so that you can include mm -hmm. a response to this in the information you give council? As I understand it, we are prepared to put the utilities underground because they're going underground to go underneath the new street. So the cost to put them underground we're already incurring. MidAmerican is already planning on putting new utilities and poles and moving them anyway. And, and so it, it would strike me that a lot of the incremental budget to put it underground is already happening. On top of that, in Beaverdale, 10 years ago when the streetscape happened there, we were able to save the business, the property owners, significant money by taking the utilities up the side of the building and putting them in exactly where they were before. And I want to make sure that the property owners that may have said, I can't afford to do this, know that there's a low-cost alternative of, of wrapping it around and using the exact same service internally that they had before. I'm, I'm making some assumptions there, but I know that's the way we've approached it in other areas of the city at different times when I was involved with Beaverdale. And I just want to make sure that businesses didn't throw up the white towel and 
and give up because they thought it was, you know, a couple hundred thousand dollars we were pushing off on them. I think there's affordable ways to do it since we're already in the ground. We're doing the expensive part for the city and the contractor and the utility by putting them underground already. I think that could come back with it. Yeah, I was going to say, to, there's a lot more detail yet behind that, so I can absolutely get you that file and those talking points. The, but for clarity for the public, uh, the intent is, and it's designed to remove the overhead across second as you're driving you to eliminate the across. Uh, the additional cost that we could not in incur within the budget was a long second along the sidewalks, if you will. Uh, and but we'll bring that detail back to you. But okay, I think we'll just get we'll all the detail wait. and bring it yeah. back at one time. I just think he had some good points that we're already relocating the poles and we're re relocating all of the electric. Whether we put new poles up or they bury it in the ground, I guess I'd I guess I'd like to see some of the we, yeah. cost changes. We have that. We'll bring that back. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So this item will be moved. To the next well, step. I need to hear a motion for two weeks. I'll, I'll, I'll move it, and the motion is to continue continue to to, to, to the December eighteenth council meeting. To the December eighteenth council meeting. Second. Please vote. Aye. Seven. Yes. Motion carries, and that's the end of the hearings. So it is 5:21. So we will go then to item 7B, or I'm sorry, 7C. Mr. Coleman. Ordering construction of the following. Um, University Avenue, 39th Street to 48th Street improvements, receiving bids of um, 1-9-24 and setting date of hearing for 2-February uh, 5th, 2024. Engineer's estimate is 4175000 Sorry. My intention is to move this uh, to set the date of hearing, but I would like at our official city council meeting to, to restate what we said this morning, and that is that when we got the stormwater recommendations, the number one priority, uh, I think it was number one, maybe number two, was in this area along University and Polk Boulevard where this project is happening. I, I think others, Carl and others, um, uh, were the first to make the point this morning that we don't look, we look really foolish to not do these projects in unison. We don't want to do an expensive road project only to have to tear it up and do the stormwater sewers in years from now. So I would, I would rather come hearing time delay this so that we can get those done in unison or just to make sure that the manager um, has a plan to make sure that we're not spending good money after bad money and um, or bad money after good money, whatever that <laughs> saying is, um, because I don't, I don't want to see that torn up for the neighborhood and others. So um, that is, uh, that's my request to make sure that that is addressed before the hearing on February 4th or have a recommendation to delay that hearing. Second. I said I said February fourth. It's February fifth. Okay. There's a second. So. Please vote. Aye. Seven yes. Motion carries. The next item would be item fourteen. The approving the settlement and payment to Essence Welch. Yeah. Thank you, uh, Mayor Pro Tem. So we've kind of had a, we don't very often talk about settlements, um, partly because of the challenge that, that they pose. You know, we have, I think, two different responsibilities. Um, one, we have a responsibility to uh, prudently manage our risk and 
any litigation that we are in. Uh, and then we also have a responsibility to look at, uh, to the extent that there are incidents, to look at the broader picture uh, and look at the performance of our department and look at the steps that, uh, that we can take to continually improve service, to improve accountability, uh, and, and to take steps to ensure that we don't, uh, we don't have future incidents. And that's the piece that I really want, want to talk about. And we've taken some, I think, important steps. You know, we, we've had uh, both the Public Works LLC and 20, uh, 21CP have provided us reports that provide roadmaps for us to provide some of that accountability and improved service. I think, uh, you know, having a, agenda items like this underscores the importance of that work uh, and the need for that work. And in particular, I wanted to, to call attention to a part of the 21 CP report that we didn't spend any time talking about a couple weeks back at our work session, but that I think is particularly relevant um, at, at this moment in time. There were five pages that, that talked about uh, First Amendment, crowd management, and, and protest, uh, and specifically highlighted some, uh, some concerns and some recommendations. And I wanted to read directly from, from uh, a part of that report on page 45, um, where they were talking about, about that, that section, and particularly in the context of, uh, uh, of the, the, the protests of 2020. Uh, and the report states, it should also be noted here that in our discussion with the Office of Professional Standards, little if any attempt was made to systematically review the complaints or lawsuits for DMPD improvement. Though there were four sustained use of force complaints, 21CP was not provided any review of DMPD of all protest related complaints, whether sustained or not, and an analysis of ways that they could be related for insights about the larger system of DMPD response to protests. The 21CP team was especially concerned about this issue after reviewing protest videos that appeared to contain multiple instances of behavior that potentially violated <coughs> DMPD policies. Uh, it went on to provide several recommendations on how to address this, uh, including uh, Recommendation 24, which was essentially an after-action review that has not happened. They acknowledged the difficulty of doing this in the context of litigation, but also the importance of doing that. And I think this item underscores the importance of our continued follow-up on these items. Uh, and I would like to see, and I know the manager has uh, indicated that we would get uh, get an update to council on all of the recommendations in the 21 C CP report, uh, including these items. And I'd like to know what our plan is for for action on those on those particular pieces, including the the after action review. So that that's what I wanted to talk about. I think this work is important, and and that it, it underscores our need to keep following up on the pieces that we have already started with that 20. 21 CP review and others. And so is there a motion on this item? I, I, would, I would be happy to move item 14 uh, and also to direct the manager to report back to the council uh, on, the, uh, on the items in the 21 CP report uh, and the status on those items in terms of how we are planning on implementing them. Didn't we already say that we would have quarterly reports, I believe, at our last meeting when we had the report given? So I think that that should be covered. So is there a second on this item 14? Just, Just the item as is. As is. The item, are you making a motion for this item alone? Well, I, I was asking, and all I thought I was doing was formalizing what, what was said at the work session, which is that there would be report outs 
uh, report out on the on the items. I, if uh, council doesn't want to formally do that, I'm happy to just. I mean, I I would prefer to formally recognize that we want report outs, but if not, if no one wants to second that, that's fine. I was asking really for. Yes. Yeah. Um, Mayor and Council, I would I would say that I've already committed to that in the other conversations, so uh, I'll leave that to you whether you want to repeat that in this motion or not. It's going to get done on a quarterly basis. I'll second the motion. Aye. Motion, looks like the motion carries. Seven, yes. Number 18 is the Fourth Amendment to the Urban Renewal Agreement with Nelson Development 1 LLC to purchase and develop city-owned property at 418 East Grand Avenue in the Metro Center Urban Renewal Area. Council Communication Number 23-548. Is there anyone like to speak on that? Yeah. If not, I, I pulled this item. I've got a, a few things that I'd like to address related to this item. Uh, and I spent some time at our last meeting talking, of, talking about uh, what I think is the need for greater uh, community benefit in our development agreements and in comprehensively addressing that. And this particular item uh, and this particular developer informed some of why I thought we needed that. Uh, there are other projects that have been in my ward with, with this particular developer where uh, we've seen various pieces. Um, well, I'll, I'll step back. There, there are multiple pieces to this. One is uh, I'd like, like us to do more uh, from a workforce uh, and labor perspective in all our development agreements. Uh, and that's hopefully something that we will be addressing going forward, that we will be having a workshop on at some point. I think we could be doing more to include that in this particular agreement, and I'd like to see that included in this particular agreement. My understanding is there's not currently support for that. There are other items that I think we need to be addressing from a community benefit. Uh, and we've seen it in a number of instances. So for example, the Fleming building was recently sold and we assigned, uh, we assigned the development agreement to a new owner. Uh, when properties that still have ongoing TIF, you know, one of the things that we're told in these negotiations is we either can't do, we can't, we can't make labor standards work, we can't, uh, we can't make apprenticeship programs or prevailing wage work, we can't make greater affordable housing work. When projects are sold off later, uh, the developer enjoys all of the upside, but I think we should have, again, more protection uh, in those cases. The simplest way to do that in a multifamily after the fact, we can't go back and pay the people who worked on the project more afterwards. We can't go back and put in new environmental uh, and efficiency measures, uh, but we can get more affordability out of projects. And it's at this juncture, before we approve terms, that it would be appropriate to add things of that nature. Uh, Another example, and something that I'm particularly concerned about, uh, is there are a couple of projects on university where we have, uh, this has been part of the third ward, I, I think it's now part of uh, Council Member Coleman's ward with the shift in boundaries. We approved projects, uh, and, and we approved a development agreement I have heard from multiple folks in the neighborhood that there have been small businesses that wanted to go into empty commercial bays in those projects, and that the developer is wanting to get a premium above what other commercial properties in that area are currently going for. And the developer is holding out 
Uh, and that's small businesses that are not contributing on that corridor that are being pushed, in some cases, outside of our community altogether to other parts of the metro. Uh, and I think that's a problem. And I think we can address that uh, with better language in our development agreements. And I think we should. And most importantly, I'd like to see us do more uh, on, a, on a whole host of other pieces, but particularly on the labor side of these agreements. And in this particular case, I talked with staff, because um, uh, for this developer, we waived a, uh, some loan requirements on another parcel uh, and some things that were owed the city without, any, without getting anything in return. My ask to staff was, if we did that, would this allow you to negotiate for better standards on this particular agreement? Uh, things like verifiable payroll, which has been included in other development agreements, that was the specific term that we talked about. And staff told me, yeah, we'll be able to uh, negotiate better. And that's not here. That's not in this agreement. I understand that we've got to take steps as a council and collectively set some policy to get there. This agreement to me is a good example of what we're missing out on by not having a strong community benefit policy. And I'm uncomfortable with what has been negotiated and I'm not prepared to vote for it or move it tonight. I know the votes are likely there, but that's where I'm at. Any other discussion? I'll move item 18. Is there a second? Second. Please vote. Aye. Six yes, one no. Motion carries. Motion carries. Okay. Next item. Back to number thirty-four. This is to receive and file the Public Works Stormwater Infrastructure Advisory Committee 2022 Annual Report, Council Communication Number 23-542. And is Gloria speaking? Gloria Hoffman, I, you want to stay down there and we can bring the mic to you? Oh, that would be great. Okay. So Gloria, I believe, is the chair of the committee. That's perfect. And probably is the reason we started this committee, because her home was flooded in 2018. I'll see what I can do. Uh, I, I, on behalf of our stormwater committee, I want to thank council members past and present, the city manager, and the public work staff for all of their work in supporting these projects. Such an important issue. Um, more has been accomplished in the last five years than had been accomplished in the previous 20 after the 1998 flood. There have been five completed projects through the city and one that's still in process just in the last five years, and we are most appreciative of that. You have my annual report. I hope you will read it. And uh, we delayed presentation until today so that it could be coordinated with the presentation of the master plan, and I understand that happened this morning, so thank you for that. The committee was involved during 2022 with a good deal of study uh, Patrick and CDM applied us with, uh, supplied us with all kinds of information. We tried to review it and understand uh, all the different terminology. It was a challenge and our committee did a great job. Um, the, uh, we had some recommendations that are in the report and I'm not gonna read them all. I just wanted to uh, call your attention to three. One, the first one is that we really feel that uh, the uh, stormwater utility tax fees have to be reviewed on a continuing basis because that is the only dedicated fund for uh, doing stormwater repairs. Also, we feel that the lost money needs to be redistributed as possible, as far as possible, to allow more money from that fund to go to the uh, project. Uh, we have... Uh, couple of things. One is that uh, we hope the uh, public work staff, your lobbying people, whoever is able, will try to seek out other funding 
whether it be grant or federal or state money that can be used because uh, the projects that have been identified uh, include as priorities include 15 projects costing $125 million. That's a lot of money. They need to be done as soon as they can be, and uh, so we do need you to pursue those funds. Um, <clears throat> just a couple more things. Um, the projects are, need to be made a priority, and I urge you to do that. They impact financially, economically, and environmentally all over the city. And so I just urge you to keep it as priority, work on it as hard as you can. And then and I finally want to thank my committee. I think a couple are here tonight. They could stand up if they'd like to. Uh, but my committee has done a great job. And I, I want to thank them. <laughs> They've been a joy to work with, and so have uh, Patrick and Jonathan and the staff. It's been very, very successful, and uh, we have a great plan. Uh, let's go for it, and uh, uh, thank you for the privilege of serving the city. I appreciate it. Thank you, Gloria. Thank you, Gloria. I'll move item uh, 34. Is there a second? Please vote. Aye. Mr. Coleman. I'm sorry, I thought I had And so no, I'm sorry. That Seven, yes. Motion carries, and thank you again for all the work you do on the committee, for all of your committee. The next item is 35, and it really leads into what we just heard about. Approval and adoption of the City of Des Moines Climate Action and Adaption Plan, CAAP, ADAPT DSM. Council communication number 23-546. At this time, I think uh, we'll open it up for discussion. If there's a motion. I'll move item 35. And then we'll have discussion. Is there a second? Second. second. OK, and I think uh, we have our mayor on the line from Dubai, which is appropriate for where he's at the International Conference on Environmental Issues. So I don't know, Frank, if you want to say something. It's 2.30 in the morning there. Uh, uh, it's 3 o'clock now, I guess. Go ahead, Frank. Yeah. Uh, I want to thank the council for working so hard uh, on this um, for the last number of years. Uh, with input, I want to thank all the citizens for their thought and um, really active work on working with our staff uh, and getting the whole community to understand uh, the importance of putting together a plan uh, for the future of Des Moines. And quite frankly, I am so proud of, of the work that we do, knowing that it is flexible and that is circumstances change, is technology changes, uh, we can change and adapt to those circumstances and try to protect our citizens and use this plan uh, not only for the future of Des Moines, but I've got to tell you, I have been um, bragging about this uh, work that we have done as a community um, to the rest of the world and urging them all to make plans, knowing that everywhere is a little bit different, but we at the local level, we serve our citizens. We're the ones that see the effects of, of climate in our communities. We have to become resilient. We have to be sustainable. Uh, we have to, to look towards the future and know that circumstances will cause us in the future to alter the plan, update the plan, improve the plan, uh, but that is uh, sort of built in to this, this work. And hopefully uh, we can lead by example and show uh, 
the rest of Iowa, the rest of this country, and the rest of the world, that we could all work together. And uh, the urgency is greater today than it ever has been in the past to begin uh, immediately uh, the work to protect our city, our state, our country for the future and all of our future generations. So I will tell you that uh, um, I will be voting to support this plan. Thanks for giving me a moment. I could uh, speak for the next uh, 20 or 30, uh, but I think it's been so important that we've gotten so much great uh, input from our community and uh, I'm proud of their work and, and know that they will continue to move forward and uh, hopefully um, we will show that urgency to all those future generations. The young people, when you give them the facts, they pick it up very quickly and they know the work that has to be done. And the better that we educate our young people, um, they're the ones that are gonna inherit, inherit what we leave in this city and they're going to be the next leaders. And the more that they know, the sooner they know, the faster we can all work together. Thanks for giving me a minute. Thank you, Mayor County. And um... I, I'd like to make a few comments. Okay. I, and uh, first off, I'd like to start by thanking everyone that was a, a part of making this plan happen. Uh, I, I know our staff in the sustainability office uh, work incredibly hard to get us to this point. Uh, I know the uh, sustainability task force uh, and a number of the folks who've been involved in that task force for years have really pushed this city to be more proactive and to get this plan in place. Uh, and I'm appreciative of your efforts. We wouldn't wouldn't be here today without you pushing, without you advocating, without you uh, helping push for change. I, I want to thank everyone who who was part of the process, uh, and that includes focus groups and uh, technical committees, and everyone who worked to make sure that we had uh, the input that we needed to have a robust plan. And. I'm glad we are taking this step. Having a climate action and adaptation plan is a bare minimum, and it is long overdue for our community. Uh, and th this is an important start, an important framework, and important to guide our work going forward. Uh, and it's something that we will build upon going forward. Uh, I, if I was the only one sitting up at, at, at this uh, council table, uh, I can tell you that, that there would be a number of changes that, that I would make to make a stronger plan, a more specific plan, uh, a more robust plan. But this is a good plan and something that the things that I would like to see added to the plan, the specificity, the actions, are things that we can address going forward and hopefully build consensus on those items uh, as we take future steps. Uh, there's a couple things that I found a little bit concerning that happened towards the end of this. Um, one of which is that we are not, uh, we're not uh, adopting the appendices, and I know there was important work that went into that, and I'm not going to hold this up, but, but I'm a little concerned about the language, and I'm going to give my interpretation of the language and hope that, uh, that the reason it is there is, is for the reasons that I'm about to highlight rather than, uh, than other reasons. But, but we specifically, uh, in, in our last Therefore Be It Resolved, say that the plan is approved and it adopted, and the appendices are, are hereby acknowledged as received for continuing study and improvement as the science evolves. I hope that isn't because folks are uncomfortable with the science, because the science is absolutely clear. 
the urgency is absolutely clear. Uh, what, what I hope uh, is that this recognizes that we will continue to get additional information and more information and be able to make even better decisions. One example of that, uh, just, just in, the, uh, in the last few days, uh, you know, our appendices, I think, used a social cost of carbon of $55 a metric ton. The Biden administration uh, came out with a new rulemaking using uh, and with significant study and support for this number using $190 per metric ton. If our climate action plan uses $190 per metric ton instead of $55 per metric ton, the cost effectiveness of many more actions, many more actions will be cost effective using that social cost of carbon number. And I hope when we talk about things evolving, that is the type of evolution that we were talking about, uh, using better numbers for social cost of carbon so that we get the true impact and we know that there are so many more actions that will be cost effective and beneficial to our community to take. My, my hope is that we also look at this and address things uh, like the International uh, Energy Conservation Code. You know, one of the things that there was some discussion at, at during our work session was concern about the cost of implementing efficiency, the cost of making changes for our residents. I think the social cost of carbon indicates that there is a significant amount of benefit to our community, but some of the other steps that we're seeing out of the Biden administration shows that there is significant benefit to aligning, for example, our incentives, and this goes back to that community benefit conversation, this goes back to thinking about what we do from abatement HUD and USDA require home, new homes that are built with their financing to use the 2021 International Energy Conservation Code. And in their rulemaking, they found that the average home over the life cycle saves $14,536 by using the 2021 Energy Conservation Code. That's another example of the type of information, scientifically supported information, that I hope we're talking about incorporating into our plans going forward. Because that is important information. We are using the 2012 code today. When our development agreements say, you know, build to code and use Mid-American's energy efficiency program, we're going off of the 2012 Energy Conservation Code. There have been multiple updates to that code, and we are not aligning our incentives with what is going on. We should be. So I'm glad we are taking these steps. I don't understand why we're not adopting the appendices, but the important piece is that we have a framework going forward, that we're going to build upon the actions we've taken today, and that there is a lot more that we can do to effectively implement this plan for the benefit of our residents. So I'm happy to support it. I'm happy to keep working so that we build upon what we've done today. Any other discussion from the council? I've got a couple questions for, for Jeremy Karen. Uh, it is in the crowd. Thank you, Jeremy. Thank you for your work leading this. I have just a couple questions about the Food Security Task Force. Um, the first Food Security Task Force was involved with um, urban f farming, urban agriculture. Um, the second um, task force is about to be named, and they're they're charged with um, food distribution, um, food deserts, and similar topics. So that's another six months, maybe. Yeah, I 
Um, the first iteration of the task force, the charge was six months to uh, come back to council with uh, a report. And um, we had a, a fantastic group of folks that participated in that first round of the task force. And that was really focused on uh, amplifying resources for people who want to grow more food in their own backyards, um, creating the what eventually became the Feed DSM initiative on our website that uh, provides resources for uh, folks who want to learn more about growing their own food. As part of that task force's work, uh, we realize that you know there's another end of the spectrum that gets at uh, a lot of the the social logistical challenges that our food system faces, uh, not only in Des Moines but in the, the greater metro area. And so the next iteration, of the task force will look take that 10,000 foot zoom out um, to look at the system as a whole, uh, and hopefully meld together with uh, a lot of the work. Uh, to increase more um, subsistence uh, ag agriculture in our, right. our community. And so I think we're, we're scheduled to um, approve the members of that group at our next meeting. So that's, uh, would be the 18th, is that right? That's, so so yep. they haven't even started their work, but what do you see as the third task force? As, uh, as the third, third round of yeah. the Food Security uh -huh. Task Force? Yeah. Right. Um, it, you know, I think it's going to require thinking about the impact. So a number of the uh, tactics that are in this climate action plan address food security as an issue. And so tying together the, the work that the task force did in the first round, the work that they do in the second round, aligning all of that with a, ADAPT DSM and the food security tactics that are in here to make sure that we're capturing the benefit to our community of all of that work from a social, economic, environmental perspective, uh, producing more food here locally for the community. Uh, currently 95% of food in Iowa comes from out of state, so we have a significant way to go. Uh, in producing more of that food here locally. Um, so really driving uh, specific projects and initiatives like uh, more urban agriculture across our community uh, and partnering with organizations that can help us um, identify where those opportunities are in our community. Uh, sure. We'll be and and uh, do you have any, any recollection how many people applied to be on this? second round of the task force just a rough number how many yeah uh we posted it on the city website did uh social media postings as well and we received uh 15 applications okay. total so there's chances for like people in this room to get involved if yeah they, i think there's a lot more chose. opportunity to pe for people to get involved if they uh, feel like they have something to contribute to that, and uh, I'd encourage them to do so on the next okay next round. Jeremy, thank you. Yep. So we had Gatto first and Boss second. Yeah. Sorry. Uh, <clears throat> are we are we voting or no? Go we, ahead. Okay. <laughs> Uh, a couple of things. First off, um, it was just two weeks ago that I got sworn in, and I've kind of, uh, you know, drank from the fire hose on a whole lot of on a whole lot of issues. But I will promise you, I read this entire report. Um, it it probably wouldn't surprise some of you that there were pages after pages that I didn't understand very well, <laughs> the science and the 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 background. Uh, so I I found it fascinating. And it, it causes me to just say thanks to everybody that was involved in this and that has moved it forward. Um, that said, I'd like to use um, a significant portion of my time uh, to talk about one person that I think has really moved it forward. Um, I, I first started coming to city council meetings in the 1990s. The chair of our planning and zoning commission at the time spoke of this at every meeting and every opportunity that he had. Um, and he's never given up. 
the chair of the Planning and Zoning Commission back then was uh, a, a young man named Frank County. And uh, in his time on the council, he's been invited to represent cities all over the globe on these issues. They're not easy and they're not, comp they're not, they're, they're very complicated. Uh, but he's never given up his um, number one goal of making sure that we took care of our planet and that we took care of our city and our resources and the people here. And, um, and as, as, uh, as Councilwoman Mayor Pro Tem Bozen said, he's across the planet today representing us at hardly any cost to the city, uh, uh, citizens of Des Moines, but because he's seen as a worldwide leader on, on these issues. I have enormous respect for him, and while I agree with this plan, and I don't want to you know, uh, tell you that I don't, I cast my yes vote uh, really in his honor and uh, to applaud the work that he's done to bring our community around to these things that are so important to the future of our of, of our community, uh, of our planet. So uh, I, I want to underscore uh, and make sure that it's stressed that uh, this is made possible through decades of work and leadership of Mayor County. And uh, I hope the community never forgets that as he uh, retires here in a couple of weeks. Um, yeah. I, I made a couple of suggestions uh, to the plan, and one was to make sure that that beyond his letter, his name was in the plan, and uh, I think the manager found a place to, to, to get that in there to make sure that Mayor County was recognized. The other thing, by the way, Gloria, is I, there's a, there, was a, there was a line in there about um, uh, stormwater flood mitigation and the things, the, the, the priority we need to make it. And I wanted to change it to a stronger uh, <laughs> adjective. So I, I changed it. I asked if we could change it to accelerate that work because I think it's not just, you know, staying on course, but it's doing it faster. And, um, and that's really important. And, and maybe the, you know, the one thing that we've made the most progress on the last couple of years and that we need to make more progress on, we talked about that this morning. The, the, final, the final thing that I'd like to say um, just stepping back as somebody that read the plan for the first time and wasn't involved in the sausage making is this observation. So many of these goals have been important to the departments and our city leadership already. And I don't want to forget that and we start giving credit to, to a whole new group of people because we have good leadership. And when I think about all these goals, these goals have been on their radar. They've been working towards them. They've been doing it. So this document becomes a great resource for us moving forward, but it's not like, you know, we're at the first step. Uh, I, I think about our, our engineers and the people that design our streets, uh, our public works department, our parks department and trees. Um, I, I'm really proud of everybody. And when you look at this plan, uh, manager, it strikes me that this is, you know, in part, a real um, uh, note of accomplishment that our staff has the right priorities, that we're in sync, and that we've been on this path for a long time. This new resource kind of puts it in one package, but so much of it is there, and I hope that you share that with your, uh, with your team that has been working towards these for so long. Anyone else like it? it is there a stormwater basin named after Gloria? <laughs> there should be. There's, I think there isn't. Isn't there a? Um, Every, everybody refers to one area as the one behind Gloria's house. I know that. Yeah. <laughs> Any other comments? If not, um, I just want to commend everybody and the work that's been done. As Mr. Coleman said, it's been a long process. And we can only hope other communities adapt something like this. I know some have, but I think this is, this is more than just one thing. It's so many things that we can, and I know one of the components was education our educating our community on what they can do, whether it be some small thing, whether you take your yard and you make it a rain garden out of it, or whatever you can do, whether it's a rain barrel. I think there's some things that we can do 
even to let our citizens know that everybody can have a little bit and they make a big difference. So with that, there's been a motion and a second, and I'll ask for the vote. Aye. Seven I yes. So, Frank, enjoy your time in Dubai. So, the next item is amending number 36, amending chapter 114 of the Municipal Code regarding traffic regulation changes as follows. Council communication number 23-533, A, speed limit modification on East Broadway Avenue from West City Limits to Hubble Avenue, B, corner clearance East 20 East 12th Street between Hull Avenue and Ovid Avenue and Tiffin Avenue between East 9th Street and East 13th Street. C code correction East 35th Street between Hull Avenue and East Euclid Avenue and D code correction on East 22nd Street between Hubble Avenue and Elizabeth Avenue. Madam Mayor, I'll move 36 A, B, C, D, and pursue it to Rule 42 A. We will waive the second and third reading. It's all vote. you, Linda. <laughs> <laughs> Aye. Seven yes. The motion carries. The next is a request to speak. And for those persons wishing to speak this evening under the public speaking item of the agenda, we will only be calling on those who have registered to speak. All speakers must comply with the rules regarding their names and addresses or ward. They will not or they will not be recognized to speak. Each of the 20 speakers, I think we're down to 19, this evening will receive up to two minutes each to make their comments. Please keep your own time because at the end of the two minutes, the clerk will announce time and the speaker's mic will be closed and we will move immediately to the next speaker. We want to hear from all of our residents and we encourage our residents to be respectful of others' viewpoints that are different from their own. First one is Hannah Hayes. Hi, my name is Hannah Hayes. I'm from Ward 4. Um, I'm also president of Roosevelt Environmental Club. Firstly, I just want to thank all of you for your leadership in passing this climate adaption plan today. It really gives me a sense of hope and proves that Iowa can continue to serve as a beacon of hope um, and, and prove to young people like me that Iowa is worth fighting for and staying here for. I do also want to echo what Josh was saying about building upon this plan in the future, not only um, to adapt to the science as we see it coming in and to continue to build upon this plan. And I think part of that that is going to play into this is when we um, hear about talking about uh, funding cuts to DART, we need to make sure we continue to be investing in DART because that is something that plays into this climate plan. We can't have climate adaptation and climate action without public transportation. And so I think it's really important that we continue to invest in that. Thank you. Really, Burnett? Hi, my name is Julie Bartnett. I'm with Des Moines Children's Museum. My um, residential address is 10090 Lincoln Avenue in Clive, Iowa. And I'm here because I'm the executive director of Des Moines Children's Museum. We're a nonprofit that is six years old. Um, we are in Valley West Mall, which if you've been following Valley West Mall, we know that this is a temporary location still for us. And children's museums are all about young children from infants to about like eight, nine years old. And we just wanted to kind of make sure you guys were aware of us. When we started six years ago, we didn't know where we'd be functioning for a long time. And right now it's been West Des Moines. We don't know what will be in the future. But a lot of amazing communities, especially cities that have capitals, um, I'm sorry, capital cities, have children's museums actually in their city. So I think of Madison Children's Museum, which is pretty comparable, um, where you can actually stand at the top of the museum and you see the Capitol building, and it's amazing. Um, so I wanted to make sure I gave you some numbers there. We had 65,000 people come over, come to our museum last year in 2022, and then we also had um, 17,000 and some change from Des Moines. 
So they're impressive numbers. We're going to hit over 70,000 before that year for 2023. And so we have many amazing programs, like we're part of the Adventure Pass through the library. Um, so that means community members come for free once a year. We also are part of Museums for All, which is a voluntary program. We don't get any sort of funding for this, but we actually charge only $2 for children that um, have EBT or WIC cards. That means their parents. And we keep the prices affordable for everyone else. It's $6 for children, nothing for the adults. And we just wanted to kind of let you know about some of this stuff. And if you ever want a tour of the place, please let me know, I would be happy to give you a tour. And we are gonna have a holiday open house that we've been inviting all the city councils to. Mm -hmm. Fantastic. Adam Callanan. Oh, sorry. You're good. Sorry, there. My name is Adam Callanan. I live in Ward 3. I'm going to again reiterate that we need virtual hybrid meetings um, so more people can participate. Also, when counselors call in, notice that there's some kind of quality issues with the recording. Um, that's an accessibility issue when the mic's in the room and then stuff online is not really coming through correctly. The city spends millions of dollars at a lot of these meetings. I think that the city should invest some in better technology to make these meetings more accessible in that way um, and better have virtual meetings even just for the council part. Um, meeting capacity in this room is also low. Today we got to the point of standing room only. There's a lot of things that can and should be changed to ensure that meetings are accessible. Um, I wanted to talk mainly today about transparency. I was glad to see a lot of transparency notes in the 21st Century Policing Report uh, recommended for DMPD. The city should move to be more transparent across the board, not just with the DMPD. Um, some other issues, uh, the nationwide building and the DMPD um, new police station in that building. There haven't really been publicized plans. There's been kind of offhanded notes and press releases. Um, there really should be plans released as to what the intention is there. There should be public meetings to hear, um, to announce to people what's going on and to get feedback on it. Again, we're investing many, many millions in this project. The city is already partly committed to spending that money, um, but has not really taken any public comment on it or released what the actual plans are for that project, even though the plans have been happening for a long time now. Um, the 21st Century Policing Review itself also was apparently withheld till the work session post-election, which is very odd. Um, and last meeting on a different transparency issue, Mayor-elect Bozen, um, talked about how things that Councilman Mandelbaum had brought up, um, like it wasn't right, the right place to discuss it at a meeting. Um, I just want to say that I think policy should be discussed in a public meeting. Um, eventually a work session is also good, but anytime they're having more transparency into what counselor's positions are in public meetings, um, that's a good thing. Um, also, as always, public comment is banned on the consent agenda. And even on huge items, we just passed a climate action plan, which is great and exciting, but I don't know why the public isn't allowed to comment on things like that. Thank you. Luke Baskin. Hello, my name is Luke Bascom. I live in Ward 1. Um, I'm here as one of many who is opposed to the $56 million purchase of the nationwide building to be converted into a new police station. It's unacceptable how little this council is involving their constituents in a decision that will have huge consequences for our community. You all cannot in good faith present us with a possible 40% cut in public transit services because of a lack of funding while you're on the verge of investing $56 million for a new police building that the public does not want and the city does not need. Don't forget thousands of Des Moines voters elected a candidate to council who ran on defund the police in 2021. That is only one of many examples from recent history that demonstrates local public support for fewer dollars toward violent policing. The money is there for DART, you all are just throwing it away. And the populations in this city who would be hurt by the nationwide purchase and a cut to DART are the same, houseless, working class, and BIPOC communities. Those communities rely on public transit most and are by far the most common targets of police abuse. The council should stop all proceedings and organize accessible events for the public to deliberate on the nationwide purchase we should spend the $56 million maintaining and improving our public transit, not rewarding a police force that has cost the city millions in lawsuit settlements. Excuse me, Denver Foot. 
Council, Denver Foot, Ward 1, Drake Neighborhood. I also, before I start, I want to highlight the 20 people signed up to speak today at the council meeting, which is unprecedented since 2021 was the last time this many people signed up for, for council to speak. So I want to make sure that y'all are hearing us and you're absorbing, like, absorbing what we're saying. Um, I am here specifically to speak on DART and the purchase of the nationwide building. Uh, if we add $56 million to this building, it's going to put the Des Moines Police Department over $100 million of funding. They already take up almost 40% of our city's budget, whereas our region has grown by 23%, the services of DART has only expanded under 1%. Right, we already just had a city that uh, opted out of DART because they were only getting 11 rides a year, about, um, which is crazy. So Des Moines is going to be starting to taking most of the funding from DART, as y'all know, within the next five years. But there's this gap where we're not getting COVID funds for DART. Um, and as somebody who is a line three rider, I take DART to and from work and I do a lot of my errands on DART. Um, it takes me 20 minutes on a bus ride to get to work in the Merle Hay neighborhood. But if DART is defunded, it's gonna take me about an hour, meaning I'm going to have to prep more time to get to work, to be able to pay my bills, to be able to live in Des Moines. So not only will this affect people like me, it'll affect thousands of people across the city that rely on DART. 60% of DART riders do not have a license. Almost 50% do not own a car. So when you listen to those statistics, you understand that it's everyday people who rely on DART. Um, raising the franchise fee is going to put the money onto everyday people who pay energy. Um, and I don't know if y'all thought about this, but what if we push the franchise fee off to Mid-American as they pay taxes to the city of Des Moines? Um, and I understand that's hard, but we have a franchise agreement with Mid-American who takes advantage of everyday people. Um, I also was, I know that the nationwide building isn't, bye. that, bye. Take up, girl. Hey everybody. My name is Jacob Groby, I live in uh, Ward 3. So, uh, Part of your plan is to get more people to live downtown. That's great, we could definitely have more density here in Des Moines. But people don't move to cities to drive everywhere. They don't move to cities to live in suburbia. Uh, they live in cities to be part of a community, to be able to walk and take transit to everywhere they need to go. Uh, when I moved here uh, from a city, I was appalled by the wastelands of parking lots downtown. And I was like, How? this is a city? Um, and people are not attracted. Parking lots don't do any good. Um, you're not getting, you know, revenue, much revenue from that. Uh, you're not having more people move in. Uh, it's an eyesore. Uh, we have plenty of parking. In fact, Des Moines has 19 parking spots per household. We're famous. We're in a book called Socialist Reconstruction. It's a great book to talk about how we can actually uh, use our resources to provide for people and to protect the planet, to prioritize, prioritize those things rather than profit for developers. Um, and yeah, it's not uncommon to wait 45 minutes to an hour for a bus ride. I was at Sculpture Park the other day, a man was going to Clive and he decided to start walking instead of waiting. DART's already grossly underfunded. If you put the money into it, I know you can find it. If you can find 56 million for a new police station and 10 million for a parking garage for them, you can find the money to fund DART. And if you do that, it's gonna bring benefits to everybody in this community, everybody. Thank you. Tessita Barfoot. Hello, it's Tessita Barfoot. And I live on the 2800 block of Oxford Avenue. Or Oxford, Oxford Street, excuse me. Um, uh, Jake said that people move to cities to uh, be a part of the city, not to drive in the city. I did move to Des Moines for the public transit system. 60% um, of, 61% of DART riders don't have a license. Um, I'll start with the constituency that matters the least, the 39% the that do have a license. That includes me. Um, I, cars kill, and it's very stressful to drive. Um, I handled that anxiety by malicious compliance. You do not want me out on the road, and I do not want to be out on the road. 
Um, <laughs> if you cut dart funding, a larger portion of that 40, of that 39% uh, is going to be driving more often, including me. That's going to uh, increase traffic congestion, uh, increase the need for parking, unbelievably, more than uh, <laughs> the demand for parking that we already have, which is unbelievable. Um, yeah, so, so uh, cutting, cutting DART's funding affects everyone. Um, I'd also like to say um, any climate action and adaption, adaptation plan that um, allows for this deep of a cut in a public transit system is entirely inadequate. A just transition that will actually cut emissions to the levels they need to go to avert catastrophe cannot happen. Thank, Thank you. you. Marshall James. Yeah. All right. Uh, good evening, Councilor. My name is Marshall James. I live in the North of Grand neighborhood. I'm also the president-elect of the North of Grand Neighborhood Association, and I work for as an advocate for the Iowa Environmental Council. Uh, I'm speaking of in, in appreciation for the approval of the ADAPT DSM plan, and uh, I uh, join my voice with uh, Councillor Mandelbaum. I hope that this is merely the beginning of a uh, of a rich and a more robust climate adaptation plan. I greatly appreciate also the detail in the plan centering equity as a crucial component uh, of a just and sustainable future. Um, as we know, the, the climate crisis affects all of us differently, and it affects the marginalized uh, members of our community the most, and therefore the marginalized members of our community should be uh, held up and given greater preference when we're thinking about how we adapt this city. And so I want to add my voice to uh, those who are concerned about the potential cut to DART. Uh, I'm one of the people who owns a car, but I do use DART to get to and from work. Um, and uh, it would be the greatest irony to approve this climate adaptation plan and then uh, pass a huge cut to DART. Uh, and yeah, um, Also listed in the plan are the four principles for the uh, ADAPT plan, equity and justice, creative, innovative, health and welfare, and economic benefits. And the quote they have there is, we will advance climate action solutions that benefit our local and regional economy. And when the city is considering how to implement this principle, I hope they do so with a work, workforce-centered view of what the economy means. It has to mean more than easy profits for developers, industrialists, and investors. As Councilmember Mandelbaum alluded to earlier, the council has to be willing to do the difficult work of advocating on behalf of the working citizens of Des Moines. Des Moines will never be see a sustainable and climate-ready community if the council only concerns itself. Thank you. Samuel Hutchinson. Uh, my name is Sam Hutchison, and I live on 6th Avenue. I oversee refugee resettlement services at Catholic Charities of Des Moines. My focus tonight is to emphasize the ripple effect that cutting DART funding would cause and how it severely affects refugees in Des Moines. Catholic Charities is one of four refugee resettlement agencies in Des Moines. We contract with the U.S. State Department to receive refugee clients and provide critical services. Those services include everything from finding a job, enrolling in school, teaching them how to use the bus, registering for English class, and much more. My favorite of those services is the bus training. We teach refugee clients how to get everywhere from work to school, to church, to everywhere you can imagine the bus would provide. In September, since September 2021, Catholic Charities has helped approximately 300 refugee clients get jobs, and the majority of those 300 clients use DART bus to go to work. Many of these jobs are critical to not just the economy, but also to the safety and livelihood of everyday Iowans. Everything from meat packing, shoveling snow, delivering packages, cleaning gutters, and even cleaning public buildings, like the one we meet in today. Without a comprehensive public transit system, many refugees would not be able to make it to work. Just imagine, 
that I picked you up at the airport, a new place, a new country, and I told you that you had to get a job, learn a new language, and feed a family of four, all the while you don't have a means of transportation. What would you say? Thank you. Thank you. Lee Hallmeyer. Hello, my name is Lou. Uh, I live in Ward 1. Uh, I'm a member of the Party for Socialism and Liberation. I stand before you not just as a resident, but as a fierce supporter of DART and a defender of the fundamental right to reliable public transportation. Today, I bring a matter of utmost importance, the vitality of DART, a lifeline for our community. DART is more than a bus service. It's the heartbeat of Des Moines, connecting us to opportunities and to each other. It's the engine of economic growth, a lifeline for many, and a crucial player in our fight against climate change. Without DART, many people will be stranded as, as they use DART as their primary mode of transportation, with more than 50% of the people using it primarily as a vehicle to work. We must not allow inflation of gas prices and unaffordable cars restrict our fellow citizens when we have the chance to assist in the transportation and provide an invaluable service in their lives. Imagine a Des Moines without DART, a city further paralyzed by traffic, where the most vulnerable bear the brunt. This isn't hypothetical. It is the reality we face if we allow any funding cuts. Our community's well-being is at stake. Without DART, more cars will be downtown, driven by more people who may not have the finances to cater to the city's inordinate whims about parking. This, of course, will lend itself to more profits for Crow Toe, who, whose owner coincidentally donated to three of the council members' re-election campaigns and Connie's campaign as well, at roughly 15,000 total dollars. Who votes on their parking enforcement contracts? These members, Joe, Linda, Chris, and Connie, we know who you are. Not only do I oppose the funding DART to fund the, poli the, the police department, but funding must be increased to provide a more reliable service. It should be fully funded by taxing the rich and corporations that benefit from their workers using transportation to get to work, as well as taking from our police department's already overinflated budget. In conclusion, I'm not here to suggest, I'm here to demand. On behalf of every resident who relies on DART, reject any notion of funding cuts. Our message is clear, hands off DART. If you dare jeopardize this vital service, we will take to the streets and disrupt. Next speaker is My name is Chris B. Gini. I live at 3914 University in Ward 1, about six feet away from where a new bike lane starts and ends abruptly between apartments, which seems like a bad idea. And it also seems like a bad idea to approve one climate plan and then slash our transportation in the same moment. Uh, I believe that the city of Des Moines should be a leader on climate change in our state and our country, which even our mayor discussed earlier and Councilman Mandelbaum ran on during this last election cycle. So it's extra embarrassing that we're considering dialing things back while Iowa City is a few months into a two-year program to have free fares for their buses in an effort to reduce emissions and increase ridership. Again, in this meeting, we talked about how our great police department has uh, failed to live up to their actions from 2020, and there are still things that they have done that they have not paid for. They have not earned more money. Yeah. Thank you. Excuse me. Uh, so we can, John Knapp, Matt McAllister. Is there a... <laughs> he was, they called in and said they wouldn't be here. So unless Ethan came, we were told he would not be here. So, okay. Thank you. Uh, my name is John Nat McAllister. I live at 1445 Forest Sale Drive in Des Moines. That's Ward 1, or as some of you might know, that's on Route 3, the bus system. And uh, I take the bus to work every day. And uh, so when I get to work, I go downtown on Route 3, then get on 7 and take it up to the south side. I work for the Des Moines Schools, the Options Academy. It's an alternative high school. Many of our students need the bus to get to school. And you, you might not realize this, but many Des Moines Public School students take the bus, take DART to school every day as well. We, uh, we stop every day, and about a dozen students get off at Lincoln High School every morning. It's an important part of a transportation system. We talked, people talked about refugees, about employees, about homeless people, about others who have needs to get places. We also have to think about our students. My son is 19 years old, doesn't like to drive, makes him anxious. He takes the bus to DMACC. 
Many of our DMAC students are pursuing careers with those kinds of programs because they're great ways for low-income students to access uh, professional skills and trades. And if we make that a burden on them, that we make that much harder for DMAC students to participate. Now, other people mentioned, I did not, wasn't aware of this, this $55 million police department upgrade sounds is astonishing in this context. But I think it's also equally, if not even more astonishing, that you uh, and your colleagues have announced a $350 million upgrade to the airport. Now, why are we investing hundreds of millions of dollars in massive carbon emissions at the same time that we're slashing public transportation? I, I, I don't know, it's just a sign, and the, all three of these things are happening. You're voting on this tonight, the same month. You announced the dark cuts, you announced that you're doing this massive increase in, uh, at the airport, and then you're, right, so, but I have a solution for you. Like, I want to call it, like, it's not all negative, but there's hope. First of all, it's the easy thing to do, put a gate fee at the airport. Everybody, 10 bucks, they can fund DART that way. Thank you. That's a race, I love. Desiree Solo here. If not, we'll move on to Louise Gomez. Uh, hello, Luis Gomez, Ward 4. I'm here tonight to let you all know that I'm opposed to the city using 56 million taxpayer dollars to fund a new police station. It honestly sounds a little ridiculous to have to come out here and say that. I did send some emails to my representatives and those that are at large, and I got no response um, or even like a notice that you guys received the message. I'm a little concerned that we have to like come out here. Um, I was able to get, leave work early um, to come out here, but this is not accessible. Like, this isn't, not everyone can come out here and speak in public in front of you guys. Um, your job is to represent the opinion of the people that you that elected you right and so i think it should be a little bit more accessible and easier um for you to hear me out so i wouldn't have to like leave work early drive over here and speak in public which is very uncomfortable and anxiety provoking um i mean all the points that everybody already brought up cutting funding to dart like reducing the services by 40 percent would be um, a really strong blow to our most vulnerable um, neighbors. Um, I um, live on the south side, um, see people um, in the winter walking to get groceries. Um, Mondelbaum, you mentioned something in a podcast about seeing a family walking and how proud we are of all the sidewalks that we're providing people. Um, but yet, like in the winter, that's not accessible. Like we can't walk, that's not safe. And I think as a city government, it is your responsibility to provide accessible um, public transportation to our neighbors. That's like the least that you can do. Um, and so I do invite you to like rethink this. Also, like you should probably make sure that there's like public consensus before you move on like a $56 million police station. Josie Mulvihill, Samuel Harrington, Harvey Harrison, can we show that? And Can you put I it do? in a square? On the... Here? Yes. Oh, thank you. Probably need to come down to it. Hold on. That's... <laughs> Might be a, on the... These are copies from the council members. Move to receive the file. My name's Harvey Harrison, I live in Ward 3. What you're looking at now is a proportionality chart that was produced um, at Grinnell College. And I present it because it's the latest data point that we can provide out of Just Voices 
to indicate the disproportionality in the enforcement um, against blacks in Des Moines on the issuance of citations. And what you're looking at is that zero line represents, should represent the proportion of the population of any race that's been examined. Uh, if it were zero, that would mean that the issuance of citations was proportionate. And you'll notice that the orange line for blacks is consistently way above zero. You'll notice that over the past six years, the, the blue line representing whites has gone down and is now underrepresented in those charts, which is utterly consistent with all of the data that we've been providing to you for the past six years. You've now spent over $325,000 on two outside experts, which I think have produced wonderful reports, and over $5.5 million on judgments and settlements resulting from police misconduct. Two weeks ago, I handed you a chart on those costs, and I will tell you that they will continue to grow over the upcoming months. What I'm hopeful for is that you, as the incoming mayor, Ms. Uh, Bozen, and the, the new council, will actually finally stop ignoring the overwhelming evidence and narrative of the need for reform, demand that the city manager and police department engage in serious and ongoing dialogue with the activist community, of which I am a part, and become truly a modern police department, department by implementing all of the reforms that have been recommended in now three separate reports. Thank you. Thank you. Carolyn, Carolyn, you may... yes. <clears throat> oh, excuse me. Uh, first of all, thank you, City Council, for unanimously voting for the Climate Action Plan, ADAPT. Um, apropos for today are words that my fifth graders, who um, actually will really benefit from a very strong Climate Action Plan, so I, I'm hoping this will get even stronger as the years go by, but they spoke on Earth Day the following words, which were spoken by Chief Seattle back in the 1850s. And it goes like this. The earth does not belong to us. We belong to the earth. We do not weave the web of life. We are merely strands in the web. And what we do to the web, we do to ourselves. Whatsoever befalls the earth, befalls the sons and daughters of the earth. Chief Seattle, 1850s. He became a very respected leader of many tribes in the Northwest of the United States. He displayed the following leadership qualities. He had courage to take a stand. He had the ability to work with all parties. He also was visionary in looking at a complex political situation and having a vision of a, a much better earth. And he respected and cared for his people and the environment. Now that the Climate Action Plan has passed, you, our leaders, have an opportunity to also show leadership, to be visionary and make this plan happen in less than 27 years, not 27 years. Let's make it short. Also, make this climate, be courageous. Make this Climate Action Plan strong in our budget. All the provisions that are so important, make them budget priorities. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, my name is McKaylin. I live at 2919 Cottage Grove Avenue in Ward 1. I moved to Des Moines in 2021, and I love my neighborhood and my community, but I have found it incredibly difficult just to survive. And I'm not alone. Many of your constituents feel and are aware that we're living in a state of crisis. To list just a few examples, we're running out of clean water, we're losing access to health care, we're experiencing an affordable housing crisis. I've watched footage of DMPD bulldoze camps of our houseless neighbors in the dead of winter and brutalize unarmed protesters. And now we're watching public tra transit be slashed. I didn't have a license until September. That only changed because my grandpa died. Um, and left me his Buick, and it took me an hour to get from my house in the Drake neighborhood to the south side where I teach preschool. 
The nearest bus stop to Bidwell was more than a mile away, even though it shares a parking lot with the largest food and clothing bank in the state of Iowa. I know firsthand that DART was already inadequate. I don't trust any of you to do the right thing and step up and ensure that we have access to affordable and sustainable public transit. I personally feel that you've made it abundantly clear that you don't care about your constituents. For me, it's evident every time I come to one of these meetings where there's not even enough room for us to sit down and where folks who have disabilities or children to care for don't have the opportunity, opportunity to join virtually. But y'all should be ashamed because while DART is on the brink of having nearly half their budget cut, Iowa City is piloting an expanded and completely free public transit program. And I want y'all to know that if you allow this to happen and allow your most vulnerable and underserved constituents to be left in crisis, we're gonna bring that crisis to your doorstep. I'll move to receive and file 37A through T. And the attachments that we were given. And, and all, all the those. attachments. Is there a second? Okay, please vote. Aye. Seven, yes. Motion carries. With that, uh, motion to adjourn, Your Honor. Is there a second? Second. All, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Have fun, Mayor. Adjourn.